Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the second session for composting. This presentation is brought to you by three cooperating groups, the Allegheny County Division of Solid Waste, the group for recycling in Pennsylvania, known as GRIP, and the Allegheny County portion of the Penn State University Cooperative Extension Program. My name is Jim Spots, and I will be one of your presenters today. Together, I will be working with Joe Dector, gentleman over here, and we will present a program to you of, of lecture. We have a videotape that we'd like to share with you, and also we will have a demonstration of a compost pile out by the animal shelter. Joe Dector and I have been in the composting. Uh, we're advocates of composting, as I suppose many of you have an interest in. Joe has been composting for about 12 years. He's been in the Master Gardener's program, sponsored by the Penn State program, for about 10 years. I'm relatively new compared to Joe. I've only been composting about six years and a gardener for a long time. But I believe in the same philosophy that Joe shares, and that is that we are obligated to use our resources in the best ways that we can. And the natural resources which result from composting are certainly a life-giving substance to our soil. Anything we can do to protect and enhance our soil certainly is a valid objective for each of us to do. Composting is not a new activity. It's been going on for a long, long time. I brought a few pieces of information with me today just to share with you to give you an idea of the kinds of resources that are available beyond this presentation. The first one, of course, is the small article which appeared in the Post-Gazette yesterday morning. Some of you may have seen it. How many of you saw that little thing? Did you see that? Just a little tidbit in there. In it, it briefly describes the contents of a small book called Backyard Composting. This is available for about $7 up at Borders or any of the other bookstores. A nice little folksy presentation, has lots of good information in it, and you'll find this easy to read. Perhaps a little bit more technical is this yard waste composting, which was edited by the uh, people at BioCycle over in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, near Rondale, and the Organic Gardening uh, Organization over there. Uh, they do a lot of experimental work over there, and this is some of the outgrowth of their research efforts. Another, uh, this is about $50. Here's another one for $50, or at least this is the, uh, um, the flyer for it. Uh, it's called The Art and Science of Composting. It's about the same size in reality as is this book right here. I also called your attention a couple of others. Many are familiar with Organic Gardening Magazine. Oftentimes there are composting tidbits in that uh, journal, and oftentimes they advertise that they have a small pin or a lapel pin that they give you if you write in showing a photograph of your compost piles. So if you want some recognition by the world at large, send in a photograph to Organic Gardening and they'll send you a little button lapel pin. That's worth uh, a lot to you, I suppose. <clears throat> Your local gardening and nursery stores, such as this one by Han Nursery over in Bethel Park, often have little tidbits about composting techniques in the journals and publications they put out. Don't overlook these valuable sources for getting free information. Also, the Cooperative Extension Program puts out a number of resources, such as this one on composting. And individual universities, such as Rutgers Extension Service, put out one. Here's one entitled Using Leaf Compost, sort of like mulch. And here's another one called Backyard Leaf Composting. So there are lots of universities involved in the research and application of using composted materials in and around your home. Another magazine specifically devoted to recycling and composting is one called BioCycle. And then, of course, here in Upper St. Clair, many of you received this small brochure in your mail uh, advocating and encouraging you to participate in a recycling program or a composting program in your backyard. And finally, for those of you who really want to spend some more money, you can go to the International Composting Research Symposium, which is going to be held at the end of this month over in Columbus. Uh, several of us are going to drive over and participate in an intense three-day interchange of ideas and uh, activities with uh, people from all over the world who are interested in composting. This looks like a really exciting thing to do. And if any of you have an interest in participating in this, see me after the presentation. I'll share some information with you about it. We'll be carpooling over there just to save some money. <clears throat> One of the things that you will find out today is that because of the varied experiences that Joe and I and many of the rest of you have had, you'll quickly find out that there is no one perfect way to compost. The way that works for you and the way you do it is the way that's best for you. So if you hear dissension or competitive comments, bear in mind that everyone comes from a different source and from a different resources of experiences. So there's no one right way to compost. 
what works for you is the best way. Our purpose here today is to provide for you some very practical application. We're not going to go into triple integral mathematics or anything else. We're going to make it real simple. If you have questions, please raise your hand, interrupt, do whatever you want, and we'll try to clear them up as quickly as we can. We have some handouts for you at the end of the program, and in order to help us assess what you already know about composting, we would like you to take a few minutes and a pencil and take this simple circle the right answer test. And Joe, I'd like for you to pass those out to everyone at this time if you don't mind. You don't get penalized, you don't get belly button awards or anything else. We'd just like to know a little bit about how much you already know about composting. Composting is an attitude. It is a way that we can show concern about the wise use of some of our natural resources, which in the past and at the present time may be creating problems because we don't have good ways of dispose of a lot of the materials which are compostable. The nice thing about this, even though it is a national concern, is you can do something about it. And even better, the fact is that what you do about it has benefits to you. So you're not simply disposing of a waste. You're using something for the benefit of your property. Compost, as you know, is that dark, crumbly, nutrient-laden mixture of decomposed grass, leaves, kitchen waste, and lots of other things that we'll talk about a little bit later. Composting is also a process of natural decay by biological agents. And so it's not only a product, but it's also a process. We have three uses or three reasons why it's important for us to consider composting. The first one is it's going to reduce the amount of landfill occupied by these wastes. Each year, each one of us as an individual produces 230 pounds of grass clippings and lawn trims and leaves and that sort of thing. That's a large volume. And likewise, we each contribute 100 pounds of food waste to the landfill. It's unfortunate that we waste these products because they certainly have some value to us. The way they have the value is, first, they enhance the soil properties, particularly the physical properties of the soil. If you are fortunate enough to have a sandy soil and you know that it's droughty and you're always having to add water to it, one of the ways you can improve the structure of the soil or aggregate the little soil particles, which are like little sand grains, is let the organic lignins and glues that are the result of decomposing glue these particles together into little aggregates. And this aggregate then becomes separate from another aggregate over here, and between the two aggregates are pore spaces, and this is where the water and the air form an interchange in the plant growing medium, namely the soil. So what you're looking for is aggregated soil, and organic matters contribute to the aggregation of coarse textured soil. On the other hand, if you happen to have what we call the Pittsburgh soils, and I think most of us have that, it's mostly clay type soils. Physically, there is very little that you can do to that soil to modify its physical characteristics. You cannot get a truckload full of sand and dump it on your yard and take a shovel and try to turn that stuff in there. You'll be there for years trying to separate those minuscule little tiny particles and separate them and put some sand grains in between them. It doesn't work. You just would spend your whole life trying to do it. You can't do it. Instead, why not let Mother Nature do it for you? When these lignins and cellulose glues get in there, they can break apart some of these aggregates or glue some portions of the aggregates together stronger than others and create pores down in the middle of the tight soils. So in sandy soils, it glues particles together into aggregates. In fine textured soils, such as clay, it helps break the particles apart and form the aggregates. So there's some real benefits to adding organic matter to your soils. The third reason we want to use organic breakdown or comp composites of compost is simply they're good mulch for the top of your soil. They can prevent evaporation of the water, which is needed by the plant roots. They can add some nutrients. They prevent weeds from germinating and crowding out those lovely plants that you like to have in your garden or in your flower bed. So those are the three reasons we want to advocate the use of compost. One, 
It reduces the amount of material that goes into the landfill. Second, it improves the physical properties of the soil. And third, it can be used as a mulch on top of the soil. Okay. Now, composting is a natural biological decay of organic matter. Mother Nature has been doing it since the first organic matter appeared on the earth. The nice thing is you can help Mother Nature by accelerating the process and getting the benefits of the products that are being produced. There are a couple of things that you need to consider when you start the composting process. And the first one is that it's not the plastic bin, it's not the wire cage, it's not the big pile of leaves that does the work. It's the bacteria and the microbe and the fungi and the antennomycete, the biological element. And just to abbreviate them, let's just call them all bacteria for the time being. Those are those little tiny life-giving organisms in the soil. And not only the small ones, but the big ones too, such as worms. Worms have the greatest capacity for churning and moving the soil about and evolving it into the physical properties that you want. All of these soil animals require two elements, air, and the second one is moisture or water. The first key then to composting successfully is you can't have a pile of leaves or grass or anything squashed together so tightly that you don't have an air interchange or water interchange or the ability of air or water to move in and out of the pile. So you can't have a compacted pile work successfully. The microbes also require moisture. As you know, in the earth, there's about one fourth of the volume of the of the soil out here is is water form, and this moisture is used in the metabolic process. It keeps the worms from drying out, and also has to do with the absorption of minerals by plant roots. So there's a certain amount of moisture in the soil. That same kind of requirement exists in composting techniques too. So there's a certain amount of moisture is required in there, in the in the compost. And we'll talk a little bit later about how much is required. The second item that is required for consideration in composting is undesirable materials. Here are some things that you don't want to put in your pile. Diseased plants because the disease may carry over into the compost, and when you put it into your new part of your yard or your flower garden, you may infect the plants you want to actually save or propagate. Meat products. You don't want to put any flesh-type products in there because they will attract rodents, animals, dogs, cats, those kinds of things. We don't want them to participate in the composting process. Keep meat products out. And if you are cooking vegetables and you put a lump of butter in there or vegetable oil or something like that, don't put those materials into the compost pile either because those oils will also attract flies and it'll become a nuisance to not only yourself, but your neighbors will surely say something to you too. There are certain disease-causing organisms that you don't want to put into your compost pile. I don't have those memorized, but they will be listed in a handout that we're going to provide to you later on in the lecture. Animal waste, such as dog and cat feces, you don't want to put that in because often your pets have diseases which can be transmitted to you as you handle this material, even after it has been composted. So keep your dog and cat feces out of the compost pile. And finally, noxious weeds, such as morning glory and uh, bindweed and quack grass, all have seeds which can survive the temperature or the composting process and then be transmitted out into the new garden area or the new flower bed area, and suddenly you've got some species in there that you don't want. So don't include these noxious weed seeds. Here are some things that you can and cannot add to the compost pile. The upper portion says bread, corn stalks, eggshell. Don't write these down. We've got them for you in a handout. But just I want to show them to you now. 
These are a variety of things. There are some things also that you don't want to add, and we just enumerated them, bones, dog and cat waste, dairy products, disease plants, uh, table scraps, these kinds of things. Don't include these. It's okay to put these in there. Be careful when you're putting garden waste in or potting soil that you don't have any contaminated materials. Okay? Yes, question? Eggshells, egg yes. Most people put eggshells directly into the garden because composting a calcium and relate rich eggshell takes a long time. Just crush them up and put them in the garden straight. It'll work quicker for you that way and you'll get more benefits quicker. Now, knowing that grass and leaves and probably kitchen waste are the most common components of a compost pile, let's look at why those things are selected. We know that the microorganisms require two different sources of materials for them to actively work on your compost pile. And the first one that these biological organisms need is carbon. And the second one they need is nitrogen. There is an optimum ratio of carbon to nitrogen, and you've probably heard of in your gardening magazines of the carbon-nitrogen ratio. Have you seen that sort of thing crop up from time to time? It's about carbon-nitrogen ratios. The optimum ratio we find out is approximately 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. But the range of acceptable work can be anywhere from 20 to 40 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. Now, what are carbonaceous type materials? We call these, for simpler or other terms, the brown. Leaves and things which are old residuals that have essentially brown color to them. One of the, some of the ones, let's look up here on the list and see. Leaves, sawdust, vegetable peelings, some of the ones that are dry, hay or straw, spent flowers, twigs, those kinds of things are the brown, okay? The greens are the ones which are high in nitrogen, principally grass and kitchen scraps, which are moist and still have water in them. And so there's, that is the reason why a combination of greens and browns or grasses and leaves is the optimum because you're feeding these microbiological organisms to help break down the residuals of the material, okay? So what we want to do is make sure that when you mix your compost pile to have a maximum rate of breakdown, you want to have a mixture of these things, carbon and nitrogen source materials for the bacteria. And out in the demonstration, we'll talk about them. In the autumn time, when there are plenty of leaves on the ground, oftentimes we don't have the grass available to add to it. So in those cases, we have to add a substitute for that. If you don't have any grass available and you have lots of leaves available, then you can add approximately two and a half ounces of fertilizer nitrogen to a bushel basket of leaves and that will substitute for all the grass that you could have put into it, okay? By the same token, in the springtime where you have uh, lots of nitrogen but you don't have much carbon, there are some other sources you can use, such as sawdust, or in my case, one of the things I'm working with this year is shredded paper, just to see if I can reduce the paper waste in our area. So I'm using this rather than autumn leaves. We have examples of some composted grass up here if you really need to see, or some grass clippings cut day before yesterday, and we'll add them and these leaves that I brought in and give you an example of what a mixture looks like. Take my word for it that there's garbage or kitchen waste in this bucket. I don't think you really need to smell this, but there's some banana peelings and some orange rinds, some old strawberries, some celery tops, leftover squash, uh, I mean, yeah, tops, and. Uh, some, some lettuce uh, stems. Uh, these will all go into my compost pile at home. And these are the sorts of things that you can do in your kitchen. Now, do you want to put this under your kitchen sink? Not at all. Don't do it. Instead, get yourself something small, such as a, a, the two quart milk containers or the little plastic jugs that you have in the milk in your refrigerator. Take a cut and a portion of it out. Each day, take and set that in your sink while you're preparing your vegetables and that sort of thing. Put the skins and the, and the peelings and the waste in that. And then after supper, walk out and simply add add that into your bucket that you have down here and put the lid back on it in the garage. And that way you're not gonna get flies and nasty odors in the house. So store a small container in the house under your sink. Each day use it 
take it outside, add it to the pile that you have here, and then once a week you can take this out and add it to your compost pile. Don't put, try to put something as big as this and as nasty as this would be under your, under your kitchen sink. It just isn't a pleasant environment to work in. You should experiment around with combining different types of materials in your compost pile. As I said, there is no one exact way to make a perfect compost pile. And it's going to take you about two years, if you haven't already started composting, to find out what works best for you. So if you get poor results the first year, don't be ashamed of it. Go ahead and get started on planning for your next year's improvement. The next thing that I wanted to talk about after mixing the materials is aeration. There are really two types of processes which can form compost. One of them is called aerobic, A-E-R-O-B-I-C. That means with oxygen. Most of the best composting microorganisms fall into this class of microorganisms, the oxygen using ones. Therefore, that's another reason why you don't want to compact your piles down so compacted that you don't get good aeration in there because you're going to cut down on the efficiency of your microbes, which are doing the work for you. The second type of aeration process is really a process of fermentation, and this is in a saturated or an anaerobic condition. This is a much slower process. It's, it is normally uh, where you'd have a tub full of water, and you'd put all these things in a tub, and there'd be no air in there. It's just full of water, and it's a different kind of biological process. It involves different microbes. There's some problems with using this kind of a process. First, it produces a lot more odors. Secondly, it produces a certain number of acids as waste products, which are harmful to the plants you're trying to help. And thirdly, it produces a number of alcohol substances, which could kill your plants very quickly, particularly if they're very tender. So there's three reasons why you don't want to use an anaerobic process of fermentation as your composting process. Instead, use the aerobic process, the one which involves air in the compost pile. The next factor that you want to consider is moisture. Microbes require moisture. If you don't have enough moisture in your compost pile, the process of composting will decrease in rate or activity. If the pile is too wet, a lot of odors will be produced, and some of the nutrients may leach out of the bottom. So there's an optimum moisture content, and it, though it is not an exact number, it is a range of, of, of moisture that you can easily determine by what we call the squeeze test. To perform the squeeze test, simply reach into the pile, pull out some of the material in your hand. Joe uses a glove. You can too if you wish. <laughs> and squeeze it real tightly. If a couple of drops of moisture come out of the bottom, then you've got about the right amount of moisture in your pile. If no moisture comes out, add water. One of the best ways to add the water is use something like a sprinkling can. Add the water to it, stir it up a little bit, add some more water to it, keep adding water until you perform the squeeze test to your satisfaction. If by chance you prefer to test it immediately after a rainstorm and there's too much water in there, there are two things you can do. One, you can add a moisture absorbing material, such as sawdust, or simply spread the pile out and let it dry a little bit and then bring the pile back together again. If you add sawdust, sawdust being one of the high carbon materials, then you've got to add some nitrogen in with it so that you keep the balance of carbon and nitrogen together. So the easiest thing to do is not have to worry about that. Instead, simply spread it out, let it dry out, and bring the compost pile back together. That's the easy way of handling too much moisture. Microbes, when they work, produce a lot of heat And you will find that your compost pile will take off very quickly and produce a lot of heat. How many of you have had the experience already of putting grass clippings in a plastic bag and leaving them for a couple of days? And besides being ripe with odor, they are also quite hot, aren't they? Well, these are these microbes doing their thing, and they are generating heat as they metabolize these grass clippings. 
that's very desirable. In fact, we want the compost piles to heat up to about 140 degrees because there's another benefit, and that is it kills many of the pathogens, many of the diseases, and many of the weed seeds that may have gotten into your pile by accident. If the pile heats up more than 140 degrees or about that area, what we find is the heat kills many of the bacteria that we want in the pile. So if your pile gets too hot, you will have to spread it out, let it cool off a little bit, or add some water to it to dissipate some of the heat. So heat is one of the things that is a good indicator of the process of your pile in its composting uh, stages. In fact, you can tell when it's appropriate time for your compost to stop and you actually use that compost is to monitor the temperature. There are many thermometers available that you can use. Most of them have a long wand on them that you stick into the pile. And you will find that the heat goes up, it'll stay up to 140 degrees or so, and after a period of time, that temperature will drop down. If you can look at the pile and see that the compost hasn't changed from its individual grass and leaf forms to one where it's a homogeneous material that has no distinguishable characteristics, then what you need to do is turn the pile and let it heat back up again, or add more sawdust or leaves or grass to heat it back up again, because it hasn't finished composting. So use temperature as a gauge for telling when your composting process has stopped. After a while, the carbon-nitrogen ratio will change, and it'll go from 31 down to about 15 to 1. When that happens, there's not enough carbon for the microbes to use. They will die off or stop their activities. Then the temperature will go down. That says that it's time to use your compost. I'm sure all of you have seen in the nursery stores many additives that you could put to your compost pile. There are additives for grass composting, and there are additives for leaf composting. Have you ever wondered what's in those things? Well, let's figure it out. If you, if you buy a box of grass composting material, you already have the greens, don't you? If you already have the greens, what do you need? You need the browns, right? You need the carbon. So what's in there? Lots of carbon and a few microbes. Let's go the other way. You got a big pile of leaves over here. You want to decompose them? You buy the bag that has, that's green and says, this is for leaf composting. You've got the browns, what do you need? You need those greens to substitute for the grass, so what have you got? A lot of nitrogen, right? That's what's in those things, that's what you're buying. Carbon or nitrogen and a few more bacteria to go along with it, that's it. Why do you have to do that? You don't, you don't have to do that. The bacteria that you need for composting is already on the leaves and already on the grass. Doubt it? Here's some grass I cut day before yesterday. You don't have to smell it, but if you doubt it, you can certainly come up here and see the white spores which are lining up on all of these leaves. They're already on here. I don't add a thing to it. They're already available, and they're free. If you want to speed it up even more, or if you want to spend six bucks in getting a box, fine, you do it. But you don't need it, okay? Another material that some people add to their compost pile is dirt or soil. What are you adding? Just the same microorganisms back into it again. That's, they're still free. Still free. We're going to tell you now about types of composting. There are three of them. But before doing that, I want to tell you about types of materials or containers that you can use. The simplest one, of course, is simply a pile, unattended, just left to do its thing with Mother Nature's help. No money, no effort, just an easy way to do it. Probably a little bit higher up on the line is if you find some old scrap fence or screen wire or some old boards and put a knock together bin of some sort. It looks pretty, but it doesn't make the compost happen any faster. Probably a little bit more sophisticated than that is some of this plastic netting, or if you have some cinder blocks and you make three little bins and you move the compost from one bin to the other bin, that sort of thing, it looks a little nicer, but it still doesn't make the compost happen any faster. Or if you want to look back in the back and see some very fancy gadgets, some of them costing maybe up to $100, you can see them back there, but again, they don't make compost happen any faster than just the open pile. 
What makes compost happen? The bugs do. And you've got to cater to the bugs. This is just a way of containing the material. Okay? Now, with that in mind, that the type of pen or containment that you have doesn't really have an impact on the rate of decomposition, let's look at the three methods for composting. The first one is called the standard method. <clears throat> you don't need to write this down. This is going to be all in a handout that you have. The goal in the standard method is mulch or compost. And you can have a variety of materials, leaf, yard waste, grass clippings, garden waste, kitchen waste, uh, lots of things. Some time or effort is required for you to work or manipulate this method. The area that's required is very small. And it takes approximately six to eight weeks in the summertime in order to batch through a batch of compost using this method. Once you've selected the site, and you have the container, whatever kind of container you choose to use, the first thing you want to do is lay down some coarse, woody material, stems of branches, perhaps as big around as your thumb, maybe even smaller, just some material down on the bottom uh, so that air can come up through the bottom and you can have an exchange of materials. On top of that air, the first layer of material that you want to put down is four to six inches of browns. On top of that four to six inches of browns, you want to put four to six inches of greens. Now once you've done that, you want to take a pitchfork or some sort of device and mix the two materials together. The more intimately these two materials are mixed, the more effective your microorganisms can be. That's really the secret of composting, is mixing these greens and browns together. If you have them separate, the microorganisms have to go down to get a bite of browns and then climb up to get a bite of greens, and they're going to be so busy going up and down, they're not going to be able to do their thing. Mix them well together. After you have mixed this first layer of greens and browns together, you want to do a moisture check on it. If you don't have enough moisture using the what test? The squeeze test, right? Add some moisture to it, okay, and mix that up some. Add another layer of browns and another layer of greens. Mix them up and check for the moisture again. So you're going to build a pile from bottom to top using alternate layers of browns and greens, mixing each pair of layers as you go until you get up to the top. And that's it. That's the standard method. Once you have done that, you will notice heat being generated very quickly. Within a day or two, it'll climb to about 120 degrees or so. And you can check this by inserting your thermometer if you wish. At the end of one week, you want to open up your pile and mix it. There's a special reason for this. One of them is the coarse material on the outside of the pile, which hasn't had much degradation or composting activity, gets a chance to jump into the middle of the pile, get heated and cooked up and started breaking down. So the whole pile gets batched through as a process altogether. You don't have some compost here and rough un or non-decomposed materials on the outside. So mix your pile after the first week. Check the moisture again and continue doing this for a period of about six weeks. Alternate uh, the moisture and the mixing on the weekends or whenever you have an opportunity to mix it. The more you mix it, the better off it's going to be. Okay? Checking the moisture is important. Checking the thermometer will tell you about the rate of decomposition. If you're not generating any heat, or you're generating bad odors, or you sense that some other problem is wrong, these are problems that we'll talk about at the end of the show, and Mr. Dector Joe will present ideas about troubleshooting and troubleshooting tips, how to correct these kinds of problems. But I can assure you the process works. I'm sure you will be reinforced when you go out and see our demonstration out by the animal shelter. So that's rather simple. After six weeks, we expect the temperature to drop because the carbon-nitrogen ratio, which originally started out as about 30 to 1, will probably decrease down to about 15 to 1. And there won't be sufficient carbon there for the microorganisms to actively do their thing. They will stop doing their thing, and the temperature will decrease. So you know that you have essentially expended all of the resources that the microorganisms can use. I would suggest that you then let the pile sit or mellow 
for another two weeks. That brings up a total of eight weeks for this batch of compost. While this batch of compost is doing its thing, you might want to start another pile or put a reserve of leaves or grass to one side of it so that a couple weeks later when you do get enough materials, you can start a second pile. You can have more than one pile going at a time. So we're talking about an eight-week process where you turn it once a week and check for the moisture. Now, the second method is one that some of you will probably like better. We call it the slow method. What's involved? Well, if your process really isn't designed to produce a lot of compost for your use, and you're simply into this recycling thing, and you want to reduce the amount of waste that you have, and if you really don't have a regular source of a quantity of material that you can use, browns and greens, and if you have very little time that you want to put into it, but you say you're a composter, and you don't have much area, or you've got a lot of area, it doesn't matter, and you don't mind waiting six months to two years, then this is the technique for you. And what is involved? Just grab the stuff and dump it in a pile and leave it. And that's it. That's all you got to do. No extra water, no turning, no fertilizer, no alternatives, no worrying about carbon nitrogen A ratios. None of that stuff counts in the slow method. Just dump it in a pile and leave it. And that's the slow method. You want to wait two years? You may have to, but it'll work because Mother Nature's been doing it that way for a long time. Okay. You can check the pile after about six months. And as one young lady this morning said, she had a pile of leaves about this tall, and after she got raking through the first five feet of them away, she had six inches of compost down at the bottom. That's right. But if you want to move that five feet away to get to the six inches, that's fine. You can do that. That's all right. You've got compost down there. You're just going to have to work to get it a little bit. Okay? Now, for all of you who want quick compost and lots of it and have lots of spare time to use and lots of area to work with and a gigantic pile of greens and browns that you want to dispose of, then the fast method is the one for you. This requires more time. It requires a bigger and a more regular source of materials. You will need more space to work in, but you can get this done in less than a month. And boy, that's great news for all of you with lots of spare time on your hands. Let's talk a little bit about what's involved in the FAST method. It is similar to the standard method, but first you want to chop up the materials. The finer the materials, the faster the bugs will work them. Here is an example of excuse me, some chopped up leaves in a leaf chopper that I made myself from an old electric motor. I want you to look how fine those are. Let me assure you that those things will go so fast that in about a week you won't even be able to tell what they were. The finer you chop up your materials, the quicker they're going to operate. If you have leaves, then you can simply leave them on the grass and run the lawnmower over them a lot of times before you bag them. Or put them in the driveway and run back and forth over the lawnmower. Do you need to buy a mulching lawnmower to do this? No, you don't. Those, lawn, those mulching lawnmowers, which are now the end things, are anywhere from $200 to $700. Pretty expensive mulchers. You can do the same thing if you just simply get a composting blade and put it on the lawnmower that you have. In about two weeks, the temperature will drop back down to normal. Your pile's almost done. Let the pile mellow another two weeks just to make sure that most of the work gets done in composting. So at the end of a month, by the FAST method, you've completely composted that material. It's real simple. But you need the time. That's really the key, every three days. Okay. If not, then, Joe, why don't you come up and give us a presentation you want to do the movie first? What are you, what are you giving me a signal about? <laughs>
Stem composting is our way of speeding up and enhancing Mother Nature's decomposition process. On the forest floor, it may take several years before leaves are transformed by naturally occurring organisms into rich organic soil. But by composting, you can create conditions under which these organisms will flourish, turning your yard and kitchen waste into a free, beneficial soil amendment for your garden, lawn, and potted plants in a matter of months. Home composting is less expensive and more efficient than transferring organic wastes to an incinerator, landfill, or even a centralized composting facility. It is environmentally sound, can be done almost anywhere, and enables householders to substantially reduce their trash. This program explains the basics of how to recycle your yard and kitchen waste through home composting, describes how to use your yard waste as mulch, and explains the importance of leaving grass clippings on the lawn. Home composting is not difficult or time consuming. Most of the work is done by soil organisms, bacteria, molds, fungi, beetles, centipedes, insects, and earthworms are just some of the organisms which work together to decompose or recycle organic materials into humus. Like us, they need food, oxygen, and water for survival. Food for the microbes is your yard waste and kitchen scraps. These contain carbon for energy and nitrogen for growth and reproduction. Dry, woody things like dead autumn leaves, straw, paper, and sawdust are high in carbon. Fresh, moist materials like grass clippings, vegetable scraps, garden waste, coffee grounds, and manures are good sources of nitrogen. Composting a diverse mix of materials generally results in a good balance of carbon and nitrogen. Oxygen must be available for aerobic organisms to thrive. Oxygen can be supplied by periodically turning or mixing the pile with a pitchfork or by poking holes in it with a broom handle or special aeration tool. Aeration keeps the compost pile from developing unpleasant odors. Water is essential. With too little water, the organisms will slow down and can die. Too much water will eliminate oxygen and odors may result. The material in the pile should be kept as damp as a wrung out sponge. Countless things can be composted at home. Citrus rinds, vegetable stalks and peelings, spoiled fruit and vegetables, coffee grounds, coffee filters and tea bags, eggshells, peanut shells, straw, weeds, garden waste and paper towels to name a few. But not everything belongs in the compost pile. Do not add meat or fish scraps, bones, fats, grease, oil, peanut butter, or dairy products such as milk, cheese, butter, mayonnaise, and yogurt. These foods can attract pests or cause odors. Do not add diseased plants, weeds that have gone to seed, or the roots of invasive plants such as quack grass, wild morning glory, and bittersweet, which may survive the composting process and take root where the finished compost is used. Dog and cat waste can carry parasites transmittable to humans and should not be added to the pile. Using a compost bin to contain your organic materials may be preferable to an open compost pile because it discourages animals, makes the pile easier to manage, helps retain heat and moisture, and tends to look neater. There are many kinds of ready-made bins available through garden centers, department stores, and other retail outlets. Some are small and designed specifically for kitchen waste. These are referred to as digesters. Others are large enough to accommodate both yard and kitchen waste. With little expense and effort, you can build your own bin using scrap lumber, fencing, cinder blocks, pallets, or a combination of materials. A bin must be at least three feet wide, three feet long, and three feet high to provide enough mass to retain the heat generated by the microbes. It shouldn't be bigger than five feet in any dimension for ease of handling and to prevent compaction. The bin usually has an open base 
which provides drainage and allows the composting materials to come in contact with natural soil organisms. A top is optional. Making sure that only the appropriate food scraps are added to the pile is the best method for keeping animals out of your compost. However, animal-proof bins can be purchased commercially or made by drilling quarter-inch holes in the sides, bottom, and top of a trash can with a tight locking lid. A wooden bin can be animal-proofed by lining it with half-inch metal mesh and securing a top. How fast composting takes place depends on the kinds of materials you add to the pile and the amount of time you're willing to dedicate to composting. The art of composting is simply balancing certain factors, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and moisture, to convert organic items into a rich humus within the time frame you have chosen. If you have little time to spend on composting and there's no hurry for a finished compost, you may want to try the passive method using a holding bin. It is one of the easiest ways to compost, since no labor is required other than placing wastes in a bin and harvesting the compost from the bottom of the pile about eight to 12 months later. If you have a large volume of organic wastes or want finished compost sooner, the active method may be more appropriate, using a turning unit. Turning units typically consist of a series of bins or a rotating barrel. This is an active method because the pile is periodically turned or moved into the next bin, which supplies oxygen to the organisms, allowing them to break down the wastes quickly. Weekly aeration can result in finished compost in less than two months. Whichever method you choose, passive or active, the recipe for creating a compost pile is the same. Start by placing your bin in a convenient location with good drainage. It can be in the sun or shade. Gather some materials to be composted, keeping in mind diversity, texture, carbon, and nitrogen. Chopping or shredding the material will help speed up the composting process. Put a layer of dry, woody, high carbon materials, such as leaves, straw, or sawdust from untreated wood, in the bottom of the bin. Sprinkle with water to dampen the materials to the consistency of a wrung out sponge. Then add a layer of moist, nitrogen rich materials, such as grass clippings, garden spoils, and cow or horse manure. The thickness of the layers isn't critical, but no layer should be more than six inches deep. Mix the two layers together. A shovel full of soil or finished compost every so often will add even more organisms to the pile. Continue alternating, mixing, and watering the layers as materials become available or until the bin is full. Don't be surprised if the compost pile is warm on the inside within a few days. Heat is a normal byproduct of composting and indicates that the microorganisms are working to break down the materials. Over time, the volume of material in the bin will shrink. Appropriate kitchen scraps can be added as they become available and should be buried in the center of the pile. Keep a container on the counter while preparing meals to easily collect the kitchen scraps. The container of scraps may be covered and stored in the refrigerator or under the counter until it is emptied into the compost bin. You can continue to put food scraps, coffee grounds, houseplant cuttings, and other organic items into the pile throughout the year. The composting process will slow down during the winter months, but will speed up again when spring arrives. Leaves alone will compost, but it will take a bit longer than if they are mixed with grass clippings, manure, or other nitrogen-rich materials. Although not essential, shredding leaves with a rotary lawnmower or home shredder will accelerate the composting process and quickly reduce their volume when space for composting is limited. You'll know that your compost is ready to harvest when it is dark brown, crumbly, earthy smelling, and no longer resembles the original material. If you have used the passive method, the more finished compost will be found near the bottom of the pile. You may want to screen your compost to remove pieces of woody materials, eggshells, and other items that have not totally decomposed, 
and return them to the compost bin. Finished compost is referred to as black gold by experienced gardeners because they know how valuable it is. Compost restores life to soil by helping to retain moisture, improve texture, and reduce erosion. It provides plants with essential nutrients in a time-release fashion. Compost may be incorporated into your vegetable or flower gardens about one month before planting. By applying a three-inch layer of compost and mixing it thoroughly into the top four to six inches of soil, Compost can be used as a side dressing during the growing season and mixed into each transplant hole or seed furrow. To make a nutrient-rich potting soil, mix equal amounts of finished compost, soil, and sand. You can use screened compost as a lawn top dressing by spreading it uniformly on the surface to a depth of one-eighth to one-quarter inch. Composting is not the only way to reduce and recycle your yard waste. Shred your leaves and brush into a mulch to use around plants, trees, and shrubs or on slopes. Mulch reduces weed problems, adds nutrients to the soil, moderates soil temperature and moisture, and helps control erosion by protecting the soil surface. Woody mulches are best used in perennial gardens, under trees and shrubs, and as pathway material. Leaves and dried grass clippings are good mulches for annual vegetable and flower gardens. Leaves should be shredded and allowed to degrade slightly before being used. And dried grass clippings should be applied less than one inch thick to prevent matting. Mulching with grass clippings, which have been treated recently with herbicides, can harm your plants. As a precaution, mulch with clippings from treated lawns only after two lawn mowings. Grass clippings can account for up to 50% of your waste during the growing season. Don't bag and dispose of your grass clippings. If they are not composted or used as mulch, leave them on the lawn where they can help improve the soil. Each bag of grass clippings is equivalent to a quarter pound of usable nitrogen. During dry spells, clippings left on the lawn help retain moisture in the soil. You can conserve water, reduce the amount of money you spend on fertilizers and garbage bags, and save lots of your own time and energy by recycling grass clippings back into the lawn. To maintain your lawn properly, cut your lawn when it is dry. Mow when it is three to four inches tall, and never cut it shorter than two inches. Use a sharp mower blade and avoid over-fertilizing your lawn. Turf experts agree that clippings do not contribute to thatch. The fact is, grass clippings are almost 80% moisture and decompose quickly. As you have seen, helping to reduce reuse and recycle our yard and kitchen wastes is easy and can be very rewarding. Whether you are motivated by having the best garden in the neighborhood, improving our environment, or saving money, home composting, mulching, and leaving grass clippings on the lawn are the smart things to do. To learn more, write the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection Recycling Program at the address on your screen.
you then to adjourn with Joe out to where the animal shelter building is. You know where that is? Just right out the hall down at the end that way. Some of you who are visiting from Bethel Park or Scott, follow some of those who are the locals, and we'll meet you over there and show you the demonstration composting pile that we already have in operation. So we'll see you out there at the most in about 10 minutes. This is the ideal volume. Uh, and if you had that uh, on, the, uh, on the ground, directly on the ground, you get the same results. It just so happens with a container of this type, you can elevate it somewhat and uh, uh, utilize that additional improvement of airflow, which is what this is based on, aerobic, aerobic composting. And um, this is, if, if you remember that Conne uh, Connecticut film, the first one you saw, it's one of the cheapest things, you know, a couple of vertical posts and then that uh, chicken wire. And uh, you saw how it was handled from above. That is bad. That's a, uh, what do you call that? The uh, chiropractor's delight. Okay. But what you want to do is to be able to utilize something like this. Incidentally, this will all collapse. It was made that way. Okay. And. Uh, in three days, by the way, this was put in on the 14th, the evening of the 14th. Today is the 16th, so you'll be able to see in a minute what, we, what was accomplished here. And the ideal thing is not to stand there and mix it in place, which is what you would be restricted to do, but to open it up. As you can see, there's no problem. If you open it up, it's still intact, but that's not the reason for it being intact. I'm going to open it up. Move it. Yeah, let's move it. Pick it up. Okay. There we go. There you go. Now what we have to do is uh, have another four bricks, uh, which is, is just supported on. Here is the other bricks, that'll give you some distance, some a port for air. But that's it. You close it up and you turn it. This is called turning. You take a, uh, a spading fork, you know, I think it has three or four heavy duty tines. And uh, the important thing is remember the inside, the core of this batch is the hottest. And anything in, the, in that core is is a goner as far as you know pathogens wheat seeds but remember there are some wheat seeds that will not uh, succumb to that temperature with bindweed uh, quack grass and another one that was mentioned but there it is sitting there beautifully it's warm it's warm you'll find out you'll get an opportunity I'll dig it open here and you'll see and look in there, put your hand in there. It's quite, kind of warm, isn't it, huh? Yeah, okay. You can take samples if you want. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't believe it, believe it. Who's doing that? Those countless, countless microbes, right? And uh, just amazing. Uh, okay, now we're going to, as I say, we don't have the fork to do it, but you would, what, would you, what you would endeavor to do is to start a new pile with the outer part inside as best as you can do it. But that's the way. And remember, don't feel bad if by 1994, you really don't get good re the kind of results you, exp you should have. But before you know it, in my case, I got one out of 10 batches to be 120 degrees. The next year, I had six out of the eight going to 120 degrees. And now, whatever I do, as soon as I touch it, it's 120 degrees. Um, you, it's, not un it's uncanny, but you get the feel of it. But you gotta love what you're doing. If you're doing it, and expecting the greatest reward for the least effort, the greatest reward for the least effort, then don't waste your time. I, I wouldn't do it. You know, if you have the space and you have the time 
and you have the energy. Uh, this is the only thing you can do to improve the results of what you get in a garden, whether it's blossoms in a flower or a bed or vegetables in a vegetable garden. This is the only thing that'll do the job for you. Uh, I, the most important tool you can use besides the fork that I was talking about, the spade fork, is this. This is going to enable you to uh, stir it. You know you get the six inch layer and then another six inch, four to six inch layer, carbon, nitrogen. Then you stir it with this and I'm glad that you saw that film. There was someone with a what? A hose spraying it. You need a water supply and don't be afraid uh, if you have too much water. The important thing is get everything wet. This, after you wet it down, you aerate it. This is the nice thing about this. You aerate it, okay? Aerate it, and what we'll do here is just give you an example of what to do. Uh, this is harder than it looks. And this is what it's doing. It's beginning to lose its identification and become one mass. But this is uh, terrible stuff for the plate, for the dinner plate, but it's great for the microbes. Now. Were those leaves shredded, John? The leaves? Were those leaves shredded? Uh, I think they were broken as a result. They were brittle, and they were broken in the handling and uh, in the course of the winter. And what kind of leaves are those? Are those oak or No, uh, someone mentioned oak. Unless you can shred it, don't use oak. Because oak will, well, then you better shop around for inexpensive compost then, if that's all that you have, or get a shredder. Can you get a shredder? Can you save up for a shredder? But anyway, as you can see here, there were, if you take a look over here, you see where the pile was, the layer here. And this is what I put in uh, this morning. I attempted to start a layer here. But essentially, this is what you do. This is called uh, turning on another site. You could turn it right here if you didn't have this. But this is very convenient. I think it would be a good idea to uh, stain this wood, uh, not to rely on it uh, uh, in its natural uh, state, because. You could also use to treat it normally. Yes, you could. Yes, you could, that's right. Today's treated lumber, right. Right, because in the past there was a problem of any toxicity What kind? Anything that had like wood socks with, that had the chlorophenols or anything. Oh, like chlorophenols. Very I see. That's what they use, what, on the poles, the telephone poles? I see. Well, uh, actually, you continue. Once you get this in, it's an excellent idea. Not once you get in. Let's say we got half of it in here. Then you would say, take some fresh material, sort of rejuvenate it, same combination, you know, four to six inches of either one, and then mix that in. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the uh, academic uh, thing, uh, check it for water. But actually, you remember the lady that had the, the hose there? She didn't check it at all. Oh, they did, sh they did show you they picked up a wad and there was maybe one drop or so. That's not what's going to do it. Uh, I, you're going to rely, like I said before, I can make compost and it'll achieve the temperatures I want without even thinking about it. You're going to have to get into that, into that practice. I guess it's a case of confidence. You're doing the right thing. And what happens? If it doesn't turn out the way you want to, you know, just look at that uh, chart we had there, the problem chart, and you know what you have to do to bring it to where it should be. There are, it's a very good chart. I didn't have it. 
but I, I, I uh, developed uh, my own thinking, and that's what it's going to take, strong work and dedication. Are there any teachers here, former teachers? I'm dedicated. But that's what it's going to take, dedicated to what? To, to your own, to become happy with something that you're doing. And this will enable you to see good results, better results.